And uh, I'm going to ma make some comments as I read through the passage. If I'm not careful, I'll spend the whole message right here because there's so much to talk about in the passage. But I'm trying to use this as a starting point for the message today. Ephesians 3 verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes by inspiration of God and says, For this cause I, Paul... And um, notice in verse 14, For this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It seems that's what he was starting to say in verse 1, and then he goes on what you might call a divine digression. And he says, for this cause, and then he goes on talking about the mystery, and then verse 14 about prayer. And Paul prays. We see it in Ephesians 1. We see it in Ephesians 3. Not that we would receive things we don't have, but rather that we would see all we are and all we have in the body of Christ. Um, the spiritual knowledge and enlightenment and so on. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. He doesn't consider himself the prisoner of Rome. He's the prisoner of Christ. He's in the will of God. He's a prisoner because of his ministry among the Gentiles. That's what led to him becoming a prisoner. You could see that in Acts 22. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, there are people that actually say, we don't believe in dispensationalism. We are against dispensations. Well, you must not believe the Bible because it's a Bible word. It's used four times by Paul. And what it is, is God is dispensing and dealing out divine revelation, making it known to man. He gave something through Paul's ministry. In fact, Paul called it an abundance of revelations. A great mystery, but then corresponding mysteries, things that God had planned before the world began but had kept secret in himself until he revealed it to Paul. He dispensed this through him. The dispensation, the grace of God, God dispensed through Paul the message of grace and he dispensed the grace Paul needed to make that message known. If you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you or to you Gentiles. And here we are nearly 2,000 years later and sadly so many still seem, it seems like they haven't heard. He said, if you've heard the dispensation of the grace of God, which has given me to you word, how that by revelation, he, the Lord himself, made known unto me the mystery. Okay, this is what you might call special revelation. New revelation. Not something where God is helping Paul understand what was already revealed but rather revealing something new to him. Personally, directly, the Lord appeared to him. Gave him new revelation. How that by revelation he may known unto me the mystery. In the Bible, a mystery is not something you can't know. It's rather a divine secret that cannot be known until God reveals it. And when God reveals mysteries, it's because He wants us to know it. And so the mystery, as you study what Paul says about the mystery singular, is the church, the body of Christ. A spiritual body that's neither Jew nor Gentile, but as he said in Ephesians 2, it's one new man. Um, you can run the references. In fact, in Ephesians 5, he calls it a great mystery. So he's talking about the body of Christ. That'll be clear as we read on. There are other mysteries that go along with that. For an example, if the church, the body of Christ, is the mystery, then our being caught up to meet the Lord in the air must be a mystery not known to the prophets. If the body wasn't known to the prophets, obviously our rapture, as we say, wasn't either. It's a mystery. That's why Paul, when talking about the rapture, said, I show you a mystery. Paul said we are to be stewards of the mysteries of God, plural. So there are mysteries that go along with the mystery. All right. He said, as I wrote afore in few words, and I think he's referring back to the first two chapters of Ephesians, 
He had said some things about this mystery already. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. The body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, it says, So also is Christ, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. We're one with Him. The mystery of Christ is His body. It is Christ spiritually. When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages, so past ages before Paul's ministry, was not made known unto the sons of men. They couldn't have known it. Because we're going to see in verse 9, it was hid, not in the Old Testament. It was hid in God. And my friend, if anybody knows how to keep a secret, it's God. And if God's hiding something, you're not going to find it. You can't find it unless He reveals it, right? And yet people will break their neck to try to tell us, no, 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 Paul didn't get anything new. He wrote what was already known. If you take these words for what they say, you have to believe that Paul was given the mystery of the body of Christ. It wasn't known before him. Notice, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, when he says apostles and prophets, he didn't say prophets and apostles. He's not talking about the Old Testament prophets and then the twelve apostles. He said apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4. He talks about apostles and prophets that Christ from heaven, after He rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, sent from the right hand of the Father to edify the body of Christ. There were apostles and prophets to the body of Christ when Paul writes this. That's what he's talking about. And he said it's now revealed. All right. Paul had a special revelation. But you know what? We need a spiritual revelation of what he wrote. Paul got it new. He wrote it. He said, when you read, when you read, when we read what he wrote by inspiration of God, we need the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us. But it's already been made known. It's in the Word of God. But when we read the Scripture about it, we need it revealed to us. How? By the Spirit. So Paul said he got it directly from the Lord. But then others can receive it by the Spirit when they read what he wrote. You see the difference there? Now Paul's not the only one who knows the mystery. He's just the first one to get it. Then once he starts preaching it and writing about it, then people can see it how? It's very important. Verse 5, how? By the Spirit. That's the only way you can see it. It's spiritual truth that has to be revealed by the Spirit of God to our understanding. In chapter 1, he said in verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus... He's praying now for the saints. And he said that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him. Notice that the spirit of wisdom and what? Revelation. Not new revelation, but revelation in our understanding to what He's revealed. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling. The sad truth is, folks, most believers are ignorant about their calling. They think they're God's earthly people that are going to inherit an earthly kingdom. We're actually God's heavenly people that are going to inherit a heavenly kingdom. And you look at that and, you, and He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. He's talking about believers. So it's possible for a believer to be blinded to some truth even though they're saved and they're brought out of darkness, we need to get more light in our understanding as we grow in the knowledge of the Lord and the Word of God. All right, so verse 6, Ephesians 3, 6. Here's the mystery. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel. All right, that's clear. He's talking about the body of Christ. Gentiles being blessed, being saved, that's no mystery. It, you know, you go back to Genesis 12, God's going to make Abraham a blessing to all families of the earth, right? Uh, you have examples of Gentiles being blessed in the Old Testament like Ruth. And you have prophecy 
like in Isaiah 60 about Gentiles being blessed. But how is it? It's always through the seed of Abraham. It's Gentiles come to God through Israel, through Israel's instrumentality, through Israel's rise. What's so different in this age is we are blessed through their fall and without Israel. And that now in the body of Christ, it's not Jew or Gentile, it's a spiritual body. So whenever you're reading in the Bible about God making a difference between Jew and Gentile, you're not reading about this age. In this age, there is no difference. It's a spiritual body of Christ. That's what God is building. So this mystery that the Gentiles would be fellow heirs and of the same body. He talked back in uh, Ephesians 1 about the mystery of His will, the dispensation of the fullness of times. He talks about things in heaven and things in earth. And he said in verse 11, "...in whom also we, we, we in this age now as members of the body of Christ, have obtained an inheritance." Our inheritance in the heavenly kingdom, you see. And this uh, promise, by the way, when he said um, partakers of his promise in Christ, what is he talking about? Verse Ephesians 1.13 In whom you also trusted, the Lord Jesus Christ, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Salvation is in Jesus Christ, and the gospel of our salvation is plainly stated in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, is how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Now, you, you, you get saved when you hear the gospel, and you trust Christ as your Savior. Christ died for what? Our sins. You can't get saved till you know you're lost. you got to know you're a sinner, condemned already, and there's no works you have to offer God to be saved. The good news is Christ did the work of salvation. Christ died for all of our sins. Christ rose from the dead for our justification. And when you put your trust in Him, you're saved by grace through faith. It's not just a mental thing. Oh, I believe Jesus died on the cross. So does the devil. When did you trust Christ as your Savior? When did you come to Him knowing you're a lost sinner headed for eternal damnation and you're wicked and you're undone and you can't fix it, you don't have any good works, and that's why you trust His work? Have you trusted the Lord as your Savior? Depending on Him for your salvation? As long as you think you're able to do something to be saved, you've never trusted Him. It's not Christ plus anything. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And if you think you've done something involved in your salvation, you've not, trust what, you've not trusted what Christ did. It's not what you do, it's what He did. When did you trust Christ? You hear the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You believe the gospel, trusting in your heart, you are sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, He's in you. You're brought out of darkness into light, but you've got to learn to walk in the light. You've got to learn to walk in the Spirit. And, and so there's a growth process to that, practically speaking. But He said this, the Holy Spirit of promise, what is He the promise of? Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. Uh, we're completely saved, but we haven't experienced all that we have in salvation yet. We need to get a new body. We need to be glorified and reign with Christ. The Spirit in us is the promise of that. God put His Spirit in us as the earnest, as the guarantee. He's going to give us that new body, and the best is yet to come. So he said, it's, how, how is all this accomplished? What did he say at the end of verse 6? Ephesians 3, 6. How is it? It's by the gospel. It's by the gospel. Now that's crucial to see that the gospel he's talking about, he said he received by revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 and 12. You can't begin the body of Christ, historically speaking, until the gospel that you must believe to be in the body of Christ is dispensed, is revealed. You, you, when you believe the gospel of Christ, you're baptized by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. Look at Ephesians 2 real quick in verse number 16. 
Well, verse 15. Well, we ought to go back to Ephesians 1, verse 1. Just read all of it. Um, <laughs> Ephesians 2, verse number um, 15. I, I'd like to read more, but I, I'm trying to get somewhere, so let's jump in here. Verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself, talking about Christ on the cross, of twain one new man, so making peace. So in his body, it's not Jew or Gentile, it's Christ. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which were nigh. For through him, the Lord Jesus Christ, we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now what people will try to do is they'll say this, the body of Christ was at the cross. That's where it starts, they say, at the cross. And they say Ephesians 2.16 says it. Is that what it says? It's by the cross. There can't be a body of Christ without the cross. That doesn't mean that's where it started. It wasn't revealed there. It didn't begin there. But it's by the cross. The body of Christ, you get in it by the gospel. And when you believe the gospel revealed to Paul, you're baptized by one spirit into the body of Christ. So it's by the cross that it's formed, but you get in it by believing the gospel by the spirit baptizing you into Christ. So the logical conclusion is the body of Christ can't begin historically until the gospel that you must believe to be in the body is revealed. Now, we had this simple chart up here in the first hour. We're talking about the day of the Lord, so I left it up here just to remind you what the prophets saw. Paul said in other ages it was not made known. The prophets saw the first coming of Christ. The prophets saw the cross of Christ. The prophets saw the tribulation period, the second coming, the kingdom age, on out into glimpses of eternity with new heavens and new earth. The prophets saw all of that. But there's something they didn't see. God promised a kingdom to Israel. They rejected the Father throughout the Old Testament as He sent the prophets unto them. Then He sent His Son, and they rejected Him in His earthly ministry as a nation and crucified Him. But on that cross, He prayed, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He rose from the dead, and they, there was a renewed offer of the kingdom. Christ had come in His earthly ministry, offering the kingdom to Israel, preaching the, the gospel of the kingdom. After He rises from the dead, okay, the Holy Ghost comes down. The kingdom's offered to Israel. It's when they blaspheme the Holy Ghost in the early chapters of Acts that Israel falls as a nation. And there's something that the prophets did not see. Okay? God interrupted the prophetic clock and He revealed this mystery to Paul. Okay? Stephen, when he was being stoned, Israel killed Stephen. A man filled the Holy Ghost when he preached unto him in Acts 7. Stephen says, I see the Son of Man standing. Right there, he could have brought this in. But instead of pouring out wrath, he poured out grace. He saved Saul of Tarsus, who was leading in that rebellion against him, made him the apostle of grace, the apostle of the Gentiles, revealed the mystery of this age. All this was put on hold when God revealed that. This mystery will end with the mystery. That's clouds if you didn't know. We're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Us meeting Him up there is not the same thing as Him coming down here. Okay? That's a great blessed hope. This is a time of destruction. <laughs> but you see, that mystery right there, Paul said it was not made known until it was revealed to him. That's what the Word of God plainly says, and that's so vital to understand and so vital to see, and this is where we're living. We're living during this time. And if we want to understand this time, we've got to read what God revealed through Paul about this time and what he's doing today. Let's pick back up in verse 7, finish reading here. I told you it was going to take me a while to get through the uh, verses. Verse 7, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God unto me by the effectual working of His power unto me who am less than the least of all saints. People say, oh, you're magnifying Paul. No, we're not. Paul said, I magnify mine office. 
He was given an office as the apostle of the Gentiles. We're magnifying what the Lord gave them. We're magnifying what the Lord did through them. We're magnifying what the Lord... Re- it's not Paul as a man. Paul as a man said, I'm the least of all the saints. But he said, this grace is given. <laughs> God gave him a special ministry and a message for this age. That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. You can't search it out in the Old Testament prophecies. It was not there. To make all men see, notice that, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. What is the fellowship of the mystery? It's the body of Christ. Which from the beginning of the world hath been where? Hid in God. Who created all things by Jesus Christ. And there's more I want to say on the verses, but I'm just going to keep reading because I'm never going to get to where I'm trying to go. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers and heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. When you understand what God is doing and what He revealed, it's a great demonstration of His wisdom. Paul called it in 1 Corinthians 2 His hidden wisdom. Romans 11, he talked about His dispensational dealings with Israel and the Gentiles and he burst forth and praised to God for His great wisdom. He said... What's happening in this age is the angels are learning about God's wisdom and what He's doing in us. And then he said in verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which He purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. You've got to understand this. This right here is not an afterthought. It's not, and that's what people say. Oh, you believe that Christ failed with Israel and then He had to come up with a new plan. You know, no, we don't believe that at all. Israel failed, not Christ. And He knew they would fail This thing was planned way back here. (laughs) It was planned before the world began. But he kept it secret. He kept it hidden in himself. And a good reason for that was Satan. For had Satan known it, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2. And so he said, The eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we, as the body of Christ, have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Wow. Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Paul said, I fill up the afflictions of Christ for his body's sake. Peter didn't fill it up. James didn't fill it up. John didn't fill it up. They weren't sent to the body of Christ. Paul was. And he filled it up because he suffered for the message revealed to him, the mystery of the body of Christ. Now, isn't it wonderful? (laughs) Now the message starts. Okay, just wanted wanted you to know. (laughs) That was just reading the text. But isn't it wonderful and exciting to see the truth of what he just wrote in that passage, what we just read, what we just saw? And we didn't do it any justice. We could spend a long time in there. There's so much in there. But if you get the basic concept that this age, the body of Christ, what God is doing today was a a mystery hidden in Himself, first revealed to Paul, that's a big deal if you can see that. Because it answers all the confusion, all the isms, all the schisms that plague the professing church today. It really does. It is the key to rightly dividing the word of truth. God said, if you're going to understand my word, you've got to rightly divide it. That means this is a lot different than the rest. Everything else has got to do with prophecy concerning Israel and the nations and a kingdom on the earth. But that mystery is, is, is very different and we must rightly divide the word of truth if we're going to understand the Bible. And so the Bible, when you see this truth that we're looking at here in Ephesians 3, the Bible begins to unfold as never before and our spiritual growth begins to flourish. And you know what? We immediately desire to share this truth with other people, don't we? And we should. But it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long to realize that most professing Christians don't seem to be near as interested in this as we are. Isn't that true? They don't see the fellowship of the mystery. They don't understand the importance of Paul's distinct message in ministry. I mean, there's 12 apostles because there's 12 tribes of Israel. They're going to sit on 12 thrones, but there's another apostle. 
There's the apostle of the Gentiles. He's got something new. He's got something different. That's exciting. It all begins to make sense. You begin to understand the Old Testament and what's going on in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and then to the book of Acts. And then you understand why Romans through Philemon is so different from the rest of the Bible. Don't you remember before you knew how to rightly divide, you would read through the Bible and you'd say, why, why does Romans through Philemon make so much sense? Why am I so drawn to it? And some of this other stuff I don't get. Well, we know now because we're living in Romans through Philemon. <laughs> and it's exciting to see that. And, and so, but there are people who don't see it. In fact, most don't see it. Paul said, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, people haven't heard it. Paul said, I want to make all men see. All men see the fellowship of the mystery. Most don't see it. Why is that? Why? And this is a question I get all the time. Why is it that so few see what God has so graciously allowed us to see? Well, the root problem is Satan. Now, hang on, though. He, he, you know, he didn't get all the blame. He didn't get all the blame, but that's really at the root. Look in Ephesians 6. I'm going to talk to you for a minute here about Satan's involvement in this, and then I'm going to show you how man participates in it. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. That's a spiritual armor. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Those wiles are the things he uses to beguile and to deceive. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the darkness, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore. All right, look. The devil is real. <laughs> and he will work to oppose what God is doing. God is real. God is at work. Satan is real. He's at work. Now, the most important thing is to know who the Lord is and what He's doing. Okay, if not, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more important than that. To know who the Lord is as revealed in His Word and to understand what He's doing and how He's working, that's the most important thing of all. But after you see that in the Word of God, you better understand something about who the devil is and how he works to oppose what God is doing. Because if you're not careful, you're going to wind up on the devil's side, practically speaking. He'll deceive you into thinking you're on the right side. Did you know people that are on the devil's side, most of them think they're on God's side? The Lord said they're going to be those who persecute you, want to kill you, and they're thinking they're doing God's service. Saul of Tarsus thought he was right with God when he was killing God's people. He was deceived. Now look, God never changes in, in his person, but he does change in his dealings with man. That's a dispensational truth. When he reveals new revelation and makes a change, and man's irresponsible for that, uh, to know that, and, and, and uh, so on. Well, just like God changes in his dealings with man through the ages, so does the devil. Paul said, we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. If you're ignorant of the devil's devices, you're, at a, you're giving him an advantage. Isn't that a scary thought? Paul said, lest we give Satan an advantage... We're not ignorant of his devices. 2 Corinthians 2.11 Can you imagine giving Satan an advantage in your life? That's a scary thought, but people do it all the time because they're ignorant of how he's working. When Christ was on the earth doing visible signs and wonders, Satan's opposition was also visible. All that devil activity, all of that, right? It was all visible and it was being manifested. Well, God in this age is working spiritually. Primarily, he's building a spiritual body, the body of Christ. And so Satan's work is primarily what? Spiritual in nature. In other words, when you read what Paul says about Satan, you know what he warns us about again and again? Spiritual deception. That's the danger. Um, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. 1 Timothy 4, 1. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 13. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. He talks about the devil's wiles, how he beguiles, how he bewitches 
and deceives and on and on. And if you don't put on the whole armor of God, you can't stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, you're on the winning side if you're saved. You're out of darkness and in the light. But practically speaking, if you don't put on the whole armor of God and walk in the light, you can then give place to the devil and be greatly hindered in your life, practically speaking. Satan can't destroy your soul, but he can destroy your life if you let him. Now here's the thing. What is the will of God today? The will of God today is plainly stated in 1 Timothy 2 verse 4 that God will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. So guess what, you, guess what Satan's will then is? To have all men not to be saved, nor to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Uh, Paul had a twofold ministry in Colossians 1. It was to every creature with the gospel, and then it was to the church with the mystery. God will have all men to be saved. You believe the gospel, the grace of God, you're in the body of Christ. What does it mean to be in the body of Christ? That's the mystery. You've got to look to Paul and what the Lord gave him to understand that. So what is Satan doing? He's seeking to blind sinners to the gospel. Isn't that what Paul said? If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. How is he blinding people to the gospel? Not by trying to get rid of the gospel, trying to counterfeit it. How does he counterfeit it? Added works. Anybody, I don't care what the work is, whether baptism, church membership, or wiggling your little finger, whatever the work is, when man comes in and says, it's Jesus Christ, but there's more to it than that, you've got to do your part. He's perverted the gospel of Christ. Paul said, let him be accursed. Galatians 1. Those counterfeit gospels. You see, Satan will counterfeit the gospel. You know what Satan will do? He's so crafty, he'll take a gospel that's in the Bible. He'll take the gospel of the kingdom. And there are preachers standing up all over the place today on this Sunday morning saying, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That's not the gospel of your salvation. That, was, that had to do with the nation Israel in Acts chapter 2. It's got nothing to do with us. But if Satan, Satan's not just trying to get rid of the Bible, he uses it. He adds to it, he takes from it, he twists it, he, he, he uses it out of context, and he certainly don't want to rightly divide it. And there's another gospel Paul warned us about, counterfeit another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel, 2 Corinthians 11. He said, Satan is transformed to an angel of light. He's the God of this world. He's behind the religion of this world. All religion is trusting in the flesh of man instead of putting their trust in the finished work of Christ. Well, you know what Paul said about Satan? He said in 2 Corinthians 11, you'll turn there. He said, um, But I fear, lest as by any means as the serpent beguiled the woman through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What is the simplicity that is in Christ? You're complete in Him. Members of His body. Most Christians don't know that. They think they have to be made complete through water baptism, church membership, and living by the church's rules. Legalism is a performance-based religious system putting your trust in your flesh to try to earn God's favor. Hey, if you think you're obtaining God's favor by anything you're doing, you're a legalist, even if you don't know it. You can't earn God's favor. God looks at your flesh. He, see, he sees filthy rags. What gives us God's favor? Christ. The righteousness of Christ. But see, Satan, man, he's got people drawn away, trying to establish their own righteousness. So he, he talked about being fearful of believers being beguiled, just like the woman in Genesis 3, and corrupting their minds from the simplicity that is in Christ. I'm going to tell you something. If you know anything about Satan, you know he's full of pride, don't you? Isn't that the first sin in the universe? The root sin that leads to all others? He said, I will, I will, I will five times the number of death. God responded and said, I will. And I'm going to bring you down to the bottom of the pit. But here's the thing. You know what the mystery did whenever God revealed this? You know what that did? That made a fool out of Satan. Because when Satan had Christ crucified, he thought he was getting rid of the king of the Jews. And he was messing up Israel's program. 
And he got in Judas. Judas had Satan in him when he betrayed Christ. Satan wanted Christ crucified, but Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2, had the princes of this world known this mystery, this hidden wisdom, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So when God revealed that mystery, you're talking about infuriating Satan. It made a fool out of him, so he's working overtime to make sure nobody sees that. You understand? And so what do you have? 1 Timothy 3 talks about the mystery of godliness. What is that? The body of Christ. We are made godly solely by being members of His body, who we are in Him. What does Satan have? It's called the mystery of iniquity. What is that? Iniquity in the form of religion. It's been working a long time in this world. So at the end of 1 Timothy 3, it talks about the mystery of godliness. And that's why when you get into 1 Timothy 4, he said... Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what is it? Commanding you to abstain from meats. Okay, you can be made godly if you keep the dietary law. You can be made godly if you, keep, if you do this and do that. And what is it? It's getting man to put his confidence in his flesh. Paul said in the last days they'll have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. You know what a form of godliness is? It's a mystery of iniquity. But what is the power of godliness? The, the mystery of godliness. The church, the body of Christ. God is working a mystery of godliness in this world. Satan is working a mystery of iniquity. I hate to tell you this, but it's true. Most Christians are caught up in the mystery of iniquity. And they think they're right with God. That's what's going on. Look in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's the thing. <clears throat> Satan's working. But you know what? He can't keep people blinded if they don't want to be. When a man hears the gospel of Christ, if he wants to believe it, he certainly can. Satan can't make him stay blinded. And then when a believer hears the truth of God's word rightly divided, if he wants to receive that, he can. Satan can't keep people blinded. People stay blinded because they want to. They choose to. The devil can't make you do it. Everybody, oh, the devil made me. He didn't make you do nothing. He's working, yes, but you're letting him. Paul said, neither give place to the devil. It's up to us if we give place to him or not. 2 Timothy 2.15, you know the verse. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's the key to understanding the word of God. Rightly dividing the word of truth. All the Bible is the word of truth, but there are divisions in God's word that you have to see if you're going to understand it. But shun profane and vain babblings. That's false doctrine. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, notice it's not God's word, it's their word, will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that resurrection's passed already and overthrow the faith of some. Notice they did not deny there is a resurrection. They just mistaught it. They didn't rightly divide it. They put it in the wrong place. See? The devil uses the Bible. You've got to get that. It's, people say, well, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. That's not enough. That's where it starts. But then you've got to study it God's way because it's possible to be biblical and still be wrong. If you leave out of here today looking for gopher wood because you're going to build an ark because a flood's coming, that's in the Bible, but you're wrong for believing it's coming right now. It's not. That's, that's got nothing to do with us today, right? I mean, you say, well, I speak in tongues. It's in the Bible. Yeah, it's in the Bible, but that's not what God's doing today. We can prove that by the Word of God. Not everything in this Bible is to you and what God is doing today. So what does the devil do? He'll take that Bible, he'll mix it all up to keep you in confusion. He said, nevertheless, verse 19, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. In particular, the mystery of iniquity. Get out of the religious system. It's corrupt as hell, and you're not going to fix it. People think they're going to get into a religious system and purify it. God never called you to purify it, told you to get out of it. He said, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, now this is the professing church, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. By the way, he said the Lord knoweth them that are His. It's possible for a believer to get deceived, but the foundation of God stands sure. Okay, if you get deceived, you don't lose your salvation because your salvation is in Christ, not in you. 
But he said, you, you're in, there's this great house, and, and there are vessels of honor, vessels of dishonor. You need to get away from these vessels of dishonor. He said, if a man th therefore purge himself, it's your choice, from these he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle in all men. Apt. Now notice carefully. Apt to teach, patient. And by the way, before I read any further, verse 22, you know who you ought to hang out with and be in fellowship with? Those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That'll save you a lot of trouble if you'd follow that. But anyway, verse 24, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When people reject God's truth, they're opposing themselves. Notice, if God peradventure will give them repentance, and He wants to, but what do they have to do? To the acknowledging of the truth. They can change their mind if they're willing to. They have to acknowledge His truth. And when they do that, notice that they may recover themselves. There it is that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Satan takes the warfare seriously. You want to take it. Hey, you want to sit on the sideline? You want, to, you want to act like it's not real? He knows it's real. He's still working. He's not letting up. You understand? This is a war. And the war is between God and Satan, light and darkness. That's the real war going on. And people don't want to take it serious. But he's taking it serious. And if you don't, he's going to take you captive. Because what are you doing? You're giving place to the devil. How do you give place to the devil? Paul said in Ephesians 4, there's the old man, the flesh. There's the new man, the spirit. When you walk after that flesh, you're on Satan's territory now. And you give place to him. But what can you do? You can recover yourself. How? Acknowledge God's truth. So ultimately, it's up to the individual God wants you to see His truth. Satan doesn't want you to see His truth. It's up to you if you want it or not. You see, you, you've got to recover yourself by acknowledging God's truth. Now, Satan doesn't get all the blame because he cannot make people stay lost. He cannot make people stay blinded to truth. So, But when people are self-righteous, they don't like the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God says you're a sinner and you can't do nothing to save yourself. You need to be saved by grace. Self-righteous people don't like that. They're offended by that. They think they can do something to be saved. So they choose to stay in darkness. But wait a minute. What about saved people? You know what? Again, you are in the light when you get saved. That's your standing. But that state, your daily walk, you can choose to stumble around in darkness if you want to. And a lot of people do. And when it comes to seeing that mystery, and when it comes to knowing what God's doing today, and rightly dividing the word of truth, there are people, when they're presented with it, just to be honest with you, there are a lot of people who've never heard it, sadly. But it's in the Bible, isn't it? So ultimately, they are still responsible. They can read the book. A lot of people don't read it. They don't study it. Okay, let's just be honest. But there are a lot of people that never hear it in church. Never, never, ever, never. I went to church for years never hearing that. Never. But I found it in the book. <laughs> and God opened my eyes. But there are people, and I want you to understand how this goes, because you've got to realize, folks, that there are people who give place to the devil, and they choose to be in darkness. They choose to be blinded to some things. Now, when we're talking about that, and I'm not going to be able to run these references. I just want to give you a few thoughts about this. Oh, that was introduction. Now the message really begins. Now, don't let me lose you. I will try to do it as quick as I can. Just think about this. People remain blinded to the mystery when they're presented with it because of Satan's work, but he can't make them stay blinded, so how do they help them? Well, they're not spiritual. All right, 1 Corinthians 2, we won't turn there because I'll get stuck there very easily. I'm not stuck. That doesn't sound right. It's a great passage, but if I get over there... All right, there's so much in there to talk about. But what is Paul basically saying? There's a hidden wisdom of God that you can't know without the Spirit of God. He said the natural man can't receive it. If you're lost, you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't see spiritual truth. I don't care what your IQ is. I don't care what seminary you went to. I don't care about None of that makes any difference. If you're lost, you can't see spiritual truth. 
That's what the Bible says. But then there are people that they're saved, but they act like they're lost. How? They walk as men. They walk after the flesh. The carnal mind. They can't, they can't see it. They're, in other words, if you're not walking, there is a natural man, there is a carnal man, and there is a spiritual man, Paul said. The natural man is not in the spirit. He's in the flesh. The carnal man may be in the spirit, but he acts like he's in the flesh. The spiritual man is in the spirit and walks in the spirit. And he can discern all things. He can judge the truth of God by the Holy Spirit. You can't know spiritual truth but by the Holy Spirit. So when you're dealing with somebody who's lost, they won't see the mystery. They won't. What do you need to do? Give them the gospel first. There ain't no sense trying to get a lost man to see the body of Christ. He ain't going to see it. Amen. He's got to get saved before he can even see it. And then you're, if you're dealing with a, a carnal man who walks after the flesh, not after the Spirit... He's not, he, he ain't going to get it. It's a spiritual doctrine, only known by the Holy Spirit of God. It doesn't matter how great you explain it and how many charts you do. You can do it all day long till the cows come home. They ain't going to see it unless they yield to the Holy Spirit in their own life. Then there's this issue, and it goes right along with that. There are people, they're not passionate about truth. They don't desire truth. They care only about the things of this world and their own little life. Uh, in Proverbs it says, Through desire a man having separated himself uh, deals with wisdom. In other words, his desire for wisdom. There was a man named Apollos in Acts 18 who was fervent in the Spirit. And he preached diligently the things of the Lord. But guess what? He only knew the baptism of John. But boy, he was on fire about it. He loved the truth. And so when Aquila and Priscilla showed up and said, Look, you need to know this. God revealed something through Paul. Paulus was thankful. And he saw it. Why? Because he wanted the truth. When you're dealing with people who don't want the truth, you can't make them want the truth. The truth, I have found over the years, I have talked to <laughs> a lot of people about rightly dividing the word of truth. A lot of people. Most of them walk off like nothing happened. Sir Winston Churchill said that occasionally people stumble over the truth, but then they usually get up and walk off like nothing ever happened. I've seen it. But thank God there have been people, you, see, you can almost see the lights come on. <laughs> and they receive it. You know what the difference is? People who want the truth and people who don't care. That's not under your control, my friend. Then there's this issue. The reason why people help Satan is they're not spiritual, they're not passionate about the truth, and they don't study the Bible. The Bible said those in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they heard the word with all readiness of mind, and they searched the Scriptures to see whether it was so. When Paul preached, they listened they were attentive, and they went to the Word of God, and Paul said something about the mystery, and they searched the Old Testament and said, oops, not in there. <laughs> That's the way I take that. <laughs> it was not in there. But here's the thing. They went to the Word of God. They searched the Scriptures daily. Paul said, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Study to show thyself approved unto God. That's a personal thing. Let's be honest. Most people don't even read the Bible, much less study it. When I began to see these things about the mystery, you know what I did? My wife can attest. I spent a lot of time in this book learning it for myself, personally. And God opened. I'm not, it's not, I'm not special. He wants to do that for everybody. But how's he going to do it if you don't crack the pages? Right? So when you're dealing with people who don't study the Bible, they're not interested in whatever, you're just not going to get very far. And then here's the thing. A lot of people are just misinformed. They're misinformed. If you answer a matter before you hear it, it's a shame and a folly, Proverbs says. But there are a lot of people, all they've heard about this stuff is negative. Oh, you're a hyper dispensation. You don't even know what it is, but it sounds bad, doesn't it? It's a big, scary word. Oh, I heard about that. Uh, you want to know why? Because they don't search the Scriptures. They search the Internet. They get on the Internet and say, what about hyperdispensation? Then they come up with Harry Ironside's tired old book from 1930. 
and it's been refuted ten times a, a year since then. It's a terrible book. I've read it several times. It's, but people will get that book he wrote called Wrongly Dividing the Word of Truth when he attacks our position. And instead of studying the Bible, they find some article or some book a man wrote and they think they refuted it. And they don't even understand the issues. They use straw man arguments and they look for it. You know what? They don't want to believe it because believing it would mess up their religion and mess up their tradition and it would be uncomfortable. So they start trying to find something to attack it and they don't go to the Bible. They look to some man to tell them how to answer it. Then that's the issue, the fear of man. If you fear God, you don't have to fear anything else. A lot of people don't want to see this because this stuff is contrary to religion. It's contrary to denominationalism. It's contrary to most professing, the professing church at large. This is some, People say, no, I want, I want to stay right in my comfort zone. What, what is so-and-so going to think? What, you know, and so there's that fear of man. And the Bible said the fear of man brings a snare. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of wisdom. You need to fear God and you can learn His Word. But a lot of people, they don't want any reproach. They don't want to, be, they want to just you know, kind of keep the status quo. Why? Because they fear man and not God. And they seek man's approval instead of God's. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Not your preacher. Not your denomination. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Then there's the love of tradition. Oh, people love their religious traditions, don't they? Paul said um, he, was, he, he was zealous for the traditions of his fathers. Paul was blinded because he loved tradition when he was Saul of Tarsus. But when he got saved, he junked the traditions of man and went with the truth of God. And you got to be willing. Look, Paul said... Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. People get spoiled from their spiritual riches. They don't enjoy their spiritual riches in Christ because of tradition. They get blinded by tradition. They love their religious traditions. And there are certain traditions taught that's contrary to understanding that mystery. You know what I was taught? I was taught that the church that we're in today started with Jesus and His earthly ministry and the only way into it was by water baptism. And it was a local visible church. And the universal church was a lie and a heresy. But that, that's, that's not biblical. That's not sound doctrine. And so I decided, you know what, I would rather have the truth than what I was just taught. So when I saw contrary, when I saw the church as a spiritual body revealed through Paul's ministry, when I saw that, you can't. Uh, you got to go with the Word of God. Do you love the truth or do you love tradition? It's up to you. And then one last thing is this, and that's just that old pride thing, man. That plays right into the devil's hands, doesn't it? There are people, they can't learn anything. They're full of pride. You're not going to tell me I've been wrong all this time. I'm not telling you, sir. The book is. I've seen the difference. I've seen men th that bow up. You're not going to tell me nothing. I know. You know. And then I've seen people that humble themselves and say, what saith the Scripture? So the fact of the matter is, when it's all said and done, Satan's working... And sadly, a lot of people are giving place to him because they're not spiritual. They don't care about the truth like they should. They don't study the Word of God. They listen to misinformation. They fear man. They love tradition. They're full of pride. And you really think you're going to open their eyes? A man convinced against his will is unconvinced still. You can't open the eyes of a man who doesn't want them open. So what are we to do? In conclusion, what are we to do? The power is in the Word of God, not in us. Paul said that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We have treasure in earthen vessels. We need to put the emphasis on the treasure, not the earthen vessel. But sometimes we think, well, if I just present it just so, you know. Let me tell you something. You can't present something better than Jesus Christ. And when He presented things to, in His ministry... Most people rejected what he said. Did they not? 
Paul comes along, the greatest preacher, humanly speaking, to ever walk the face of the earth. He gets down to his death. He said, only Luke is with me. <laughs> he had so many people reject his ministry and then people who started out to receive it and then rejected it and betrayed him. Okay? That's reality. And so this is a spiritual warfare and we can't open anybody's eyes. So he said, well, that's discouraging. No, look, it's reality. Here's the encouraging part. What God's going to hold us accountable for is our faithfulness to His truth. Faithfulness is our responsibility. Results are His. We plant, we water, God gives the increase. But guess what? God has given man a will and people still have to choose if they want the truth or not. It's out of our hands. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, the, the ministry is laboring in the field. We plant, we water the seed of the Word of God. God gives the increase. We're laboring together with God. And he said, we are stewards of the mysteries of God. And he said, moreover, it's required in stewards that a man be found what? Uh, full of numbers and success and faithful. That's the issue. God's going to hold us accountable for our faithfulness to His truth. Paul said, it's men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that gain is godliness. You can't measure God's blessings by numbers. But that's the religious world. How big is your buildings? How many people do you have? What's in your bank accounts? That's all flesh. It was Noah and his family on that ark. How about that? We got more than eight, so we're beating Noah. <laughs> Jesus had a what kind of flock? Wasn't it called a little flock? Well, that pride hates that though. Ah, oh, we want to be impressive. <laughs> well, we're not. We're a, we're a, <laughs> we're the filth and off scouring of all things. Paul said. <laughs> Read it in First Corinthians four. Paul said. Not many mighty are called, not many noble. God chose the foolish things, the weak things, the base things. Why? He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, of all the people in the world, seven to eight billion, how many are really saved, do you think? Of all those who say they're saved, how many believe the Bible with all their heart? Of all those who say they believe the Bible, how many rightly divide the word of truth? That's kind of scary, isn't it? We're very blessed. We're very blessed to know what we know. We have a responsibility to make it known. We need to make it known, but we can't open anybody's eyes. God will hold us accountable for our faithfulness. Paul said, who is sufficient for these things? We're not. He said, we're not sufficient. But he said, we're not sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. Look, folks, it pleases the Lord that we're here doing what we're doing. God doesn't look down and say, well, I see some empty seats, so that, they're not worth much. <laughs> see, that's how we think, you know. It's all about being impressive and having the... God saying, what are you doing with my truth? And if nobody... If it gets so bad that we never have another visitor and nobody else ever joins the church, it still pleases God for us to be here doing what we're doing. He wants us to stand. Having done all to stand. If we can stand in this evil day and not compromise and keep giving the truth and keep giving the truth, it pleases God and that's what matters most. I would love to see tons of results. I would love it. But I can't control that. But when you understand what the devil's doing and how people give into that, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? The only thing we can do is keep telling them, but it's up to them if they want to receive it or not. It's totally up to them. But let's keep praying. Let's keep working. Let's keep standing. Let's keep... Because it's worth it all at the judgment seat of Christ. I think it's pretty enjoyable right now, too to serve the Lord. Thank you, Father.